Genetic Science and the Bible. We will be discussing a paper by Haber et al. Continuity and admixture in the last five millennia of Levantine history from ancient Canaanite and present day Lebanese genome sequences in the American Journal of Human Genetics. And it is available online. I just checked to be sure. Um, it was uh, published in July of 2017, last year. Um, the abstract starts, the Canaanites inhabited the Levant region during the Bronze Age and established a culture that became influential in the Near East and beyond. In case you're wondering, the Canaanites and Phoenicians are the same. However, the Canaanites, unlike most other ancient, ancient Near Easterners of this period, left few surviving textual records, and thus their origin and relationship to ancient and present day populations remain unclear. Although the Lebanese have a long tradition that they're descendant of the Phoenicians. In this study, we sequenced five whole genomes from a approximately 3,700 year old individuals, actually one of them is three six, I think, two of them are three six, from the city of Sidon, a major Canaanite city state on the Eastern Mediterranean coast. Which is interesting, apparently you can get DNA from very old remains. We also sequenced the genomes of 99 individuals from present day Lebanon to catalog modern Levantine genetic diversity. So they compared the ancient ones with the modern ones. We find that a Bronze Age Canaanite related ancestry was widespread in the region, shared among urban populations inhabiting the coast, Sidon, and inland populations, Jordan. So they got a couple more from Jordan. We'll have more detail on that in a minute. Who likely lived following uh, farming societies, lived in farming societies or were pastoral nomads. This Canaanite related ancestry derived from mixture between local Neolithic populations and Eastern migrants genetically related to Chalcolithic Iranians. We estimate using linkage e equilibrium dis decay patterns that admixture occurred 6,600 to 3,550 years ago. That's assuming a generation time of 28 years, which is interesting. Coinciding with recorded massive population movements in Mesopotamia during the mid-Holocene. We show that present-day Lebanese derive most of their ancestry from a Canaanite-related population, which therefore implies substantial genetic continuity in the Levant since at least the Bronze Age. And uh, we'll be going over that, uh, the data they have and how sweeping their conclusions are in a little bit. In addition, we find Eurasian ancestry in the Lebanese, not present in Bronze Age, early Levantines. We estimate that this Eurasian ancestry arrived in the Levant approximately 3,750 uh, to 2,170 years ago during a period of successive co conquest by distant populations. The, uh, the article starts, and usually they have a really nice summary at the beginning, so I go through that fairly com completely, and then we'll be skipping around during the actual uh, uh, paper, because we're not going to read the whole thing. Um, the Near East, including the Levant, has been central to human prehistory and history from the expansion out of Africa 50 to 60,000 years ago, through post-glacial expansions and the Neolithic transition 10,000 years ago, to the historical period when ancient Egyptians, Greeks, Phoenicians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Romans, and many others left their impact on the region. Aspects of the genetic history of the Levant have been inferred from present day DNA. But the more comprehensive analyses performed in Europe, and there's quite a few of them, have shown the limitations of relying on present day information alone and highlighted the power of ancient DNA for addressing questions about population histories. So it's helpful not just to have who people are now, but to find out what they 
what people were like before. Unfortunately, although the few uh, ancient DNA results from the Levant available so far are sufficient to re reveal how much of its history differs from that of Europe, more work is needed to establish a thorough understanding of Levantine genetic history. Such work is hindered by the hot and sometimes wet environment, DNA decays. But improved ancient DNA technologies, including the use of Petrus bone, that's the really hard bone in the middle of the skull, as a source of DNA, and the rich archaeological remains available, encouraged us to further explore the potential of ancient DNA in this region. Here, we present genome sequences from five Bronze Age Lebanese samples and show how they improve our understanding of the Levant's history over the last five millennia. During the Bronze Age in the Levant, around three to 4,000 years ago, a distinctive culture emerged as a Semitic-speaking people known as the Canaanites. The Canaanites inhabited an area bounded by Anatolia on the north, that's modern-day Turkey, Mesopotamia to the east, and Egypt to the south with access to Cyprus and the Aegean through the Mediterranean. Notice that that includes the present day Israel, according to them. Thus the Canaanites were at the center of emerging Bronze Age civilizations and became politically and culturally influential. They were later known to the ancient Greeks as the Phoenicians, <coughs> who 2.3 to 3.5 to a uh, thousand years ago, colonized territories throughout the Mediterranean reaches, reaching as far as the Iberian Peninsula, and especially in Carthage. However, for uncertain reasons, but perhaps related to the use of papyrus instead of clay for documentation, you have to realize that Byblos was the name given to papyrus because they made so much of it in the city of Byblos. And of course, Byblos is where we get our word Bible from. So, a few textual records have survived from the Canaanites themselves, and most of their history known today has been reconstructed from ancient Gre Egyptian and Greek records, the Hebrew Bible, and archeological excavations. Many uncertainties still surround the origin of the Canaanites. Ancient Greek historians believe their homeland was located in the region of the Persian Gulf, but modern researchers tend to reject this hypothesis because of archeological and historical evidence of population continuity through successful millennia in the Levant. Interestingly enough, these people point out that the modern historians were wrong and the ancient Greeks were right, or at least partly wrong. Um, the Canaanite culture is alternatively thought to have developed from local Chalcolithic people, the modern theory, who were themselves derived from people who settled in farming villages about nine to 10, uh, a thousand years ago during the Neolithic period. Uncertainties also surround the fate of the Canaanites. And this is, this, this is the famous quote that went viral. The Bible reports the destruction of the Canaanite cities and the annihilation of its people. If true, the Canaanites could not have, had, uh, could not have directly contributed genetically to present day populations. However, no archeological evidence has so far been found to support widespread destruction of Canaanite cities between the Bronze and Iron Ages. Cities on the Levant coast, such as Tyre and uh, Sidon and Tyre, show continuity of occupation until the present day. Um, so, the Bible was wrong, obviously. Um, I'm gonna interrupt this uh, reading to bring you a map this is a kind of traditional Palestine as, as divided up among the 12 tribes. Be careful, there's some debate over exactly where the border between uh, Reuben and Gad was, for example. Um, and, the, uh, and Sidon is uh, supposed to have been part of Asher, so uh, according to the original division. So take, take what you see here with a grain of salt. Uh, in fact, we're gonna look at uh, the Tyre and Sidon region. Here's Sidon right there. That's gonna feature heavily in our talk. There's Tyre down there, which will also feature, just for fun. There's uh, Zarephath or Sarepta uh, right between them. Uh, the widow of Zarephath, you may remember. 
Ancient DNA research has the potential to resolve many questions related to the history of the Canaanites, including their place of origin and fate. Here we sampled the petrous portion of temporal bones belonging to five ancient individuals dated to between 3,750 and 3,650 years ago uh, from Sidon, which was a major Canaanite city-state during this period. So what they're actually doing, remember, is they're sampling people from Sidon. Nowhere else in Canaan. Y chromosomes, incidentally, were also looked at, which I thought was wonderful, and apparently it can be done, and that means that we can trace where the men came from. Remember, the autosomal can come from either sex, and, uh, and if you, you marry a local girl, and you're from out of town, it would not necessarily, uh, you wouldn't know that your kids were, um, you know, which, which there was the father and which is the mother, but the Y chromosome will give you the father for sure, at least for the boys. Um, so Y chromosomes genotypically were jo jointly called across males from the 1000 Genomes Project, present day Lebanese, and two identified Canaanite males using Freebase. There's a program, a computer program all set up to, to check it out. Additionally, we sequence whole genomes of 99 present-day Lebanese individuals with informed consent to about eight times coverage on an Illuma high sequence. I'm going to leave all that detail out there. We merged the low coverage Lebanese data with four high coverage Lebanese samples, so they're extra careful. And you can see they had a whole bunch of different people that they were working with. Skipping over, these results support population continuity in the region and suggest that several present-day genetic disorders might stem from risk alleles that were already present in the Bronze Age population. In addition, single nu nucleotide polymorphisms, one a place where nucleotides might change in a particular person um, or in a particular group of people, associated with phenotypic traits so that side and BA and the Lebanese had comparable skin. That is, they look pretty much the same. Hair and eye colors, in general, light intermediate skin pigmentation, brown eyes and dark hair, with similar, similar frequencies of the underlying causal variants in SLC24A5 and HERC2, but with side and BA probably having darker skin than Lebanese today from variants in SLC45A2 resulting in darker pigmentation. So they're probably a little bit on the darker side, but not what you would call black. The PCA shows that side and BA clusters with three individuals from early Bronze Age Jordan found in a cave above the Neolithic site of Ein Ghazal and probably associated with an early Bronze Age village close to the site. I want you to keep in mind two things. One is from Ein Ghazal and the other one is it's from the early Bronze Age that may become important later on. Uh, again, to return to the, another part of our map that I showed you, ancient map. Um, there's uh, the Dead Sea. There's Jerusalem. And over here is Rabath Amon, today's Amman, Jordan, uh, where Ein Ghazal is located. Ein Ghazal is Spring of the Gazelle. Uh, and it's... Uh, it's a particular location that's now in the city of Amman. So that means that it was never in the Israelite territory. And, um, and it's early bronze. And both of those things become important. This suggests that people from the highly differentiated urban culture of the Levant coast and inland people with different modes of subsistence were nevertheless genetically similar, supporting previous reports that the different cultural groups which, who inhabited the Levant during the Bronze Age, such as the Ammonites, Moabites, Israelites, and Phoenicians, each achieved their own cultural identities, but all shared a common genetic and ethnic root with Canaanites. Wow. We have two sites from early bronze, maybe the, Cy the uh, Sidonians are middle bronze, early middle bronze, but somewhere in there. Um, 
And we can say that the Ammonites, Moabites, Israelites, and Phoenicians were all the same. Just the sweeping of that is just boggling. Um, we then use QPA admin 8 with parameter whatever to test whether site and BA can be modeled as a mixture of Levant N and any other ancient population in the data set and found good support for the model of site and BA being a mixture of Levant N and Iran Chalcolithic. Actually more Chalcolithic Iran. So it sounds like at least it's partly true and in fact if you're going to be technical mostly true that the uh, that the Canaanites were actually from the uh, from Iran. Interesting. The Greeks were right. The modern theorists were wrong, or at least partly wrong. After this paper came out in July 2017, now I've switched you. Uh, this is my commentary now. There was a large collection of articles on how the Bible was wrong when it described how the Canaanites were destroyed based on this article. And just to give you a few examples, study just proves the Bible suggestion that the ancient Canaanites were wiped out. The Bible says Canaanites were wiped out by Israelites, but scientists just found their descendants living in, a, in Lebanon. Um, uh, Bronze Age DNA disproves the Bible's claim that the Canaanites were wiped out. Um, I mean, these are, you know, Daily Mail, Tech Times. Um, scientists find evidence that ancient Canaanites survived today. Was the Bible wrong? Well, that's a little more doubtful. New DNA ca study casts doubt on Bible claim. Mother Nature Network, whatever that is. Express, Bible was wrong. Civilization, God ordered to be killed, still alive and kicking. And wrong is with capitals. Genetic evidence suggests that Canaanites weren't destroyed after all. Quite a little bit uh, less, less firm. Canaanites weren't annihilated by ancient Israelites after all. Study disproves the Bible's claim that the ancient Canaanites were wiped out. Canaanites survived biblical slaughter, ancient DNA shows. ABC, that's one of the major networks. DNA versus the Bible, Israelites did not wipe out the Canaanites. The Bible got it wrong, ancient Canaanites survived and their DNA lives in modern day Lebanese. Um, the, there's, that list is courtesy of evolutionnews.org if you're curious. Uh, it's an interesting uh, article. And it's not just the wannabes, actually, you know. Uh, Science Magazine had a title, Ancient DNA Counters Biblical Account of the Mysterious Canaanites. That one got a call from Tim Standish. And shortly afterwards, I don't know if there's a cause and effect or maybe somebody else that had more pull than Tim, but after that, they changed the title. Ancient DNA reveals fate of the mysterious Canaanites, which doesn't sound quite so um, in your face, shall we say. Now, you know it's the same article because one, it's almost identical, and two, the website on Science Mag says Ancient DNA counters biblical account mysterious Canaanites. And in case you're curious, I went back and looked and that's still the website today. Uh, literally today. Um, so, yeah, they were uh, kind of, you know, everybody teed off on it. And interestingly, in the science article, it says, update 12 p.m. 28 July. This story and its headline have been updated to reflect that in the Bible, God ordered the destruction of the Canaanites, but that some cities and people may have survived. Um, may have? Well, okay. Well, okay. There are, of course, multiple reactions to this from a conservative viewpoint, most of which are on the web. David Klinghoffer, the one we cited before, uh, C. John Collins being two of the more prominent ones, I think. Um, um, I decided to go to the source and I wrote a letter to the editor and the, the, they took the letter and we discussed uh, various editorial changes they wanted. Um, and interesting, in one case, we, the, I went their way and then they turned around and came back to my way afterwards. Uh, but 
uh, and I have all the documentation to prove it for those of you who are curious. But um, it has now been published along with a reply from the original authors. Okay? And my, my letter is available on the internet and their response is available on the internet. So um, it, it, those of you who got the email would have gotten those references already. Um, my letter starts to the editor. In an otherwise excellent and well-sourced article, Haber all stated, uncertainties also surround the fate of the Canaanites. The Bible reports the destruction of the Canaanite cities and the annihilation of its people. If true, the Canaanites could not have directly contributed genetically to present-day populations. However, no archaeological evidence has so far been found to support widespread destruction of Canaanite cities between the Bronze and Iron Ages. Cities on the Levant coast, such as Tyre and Sidon, show continuity of occupation until the present day. I'm going to call attention to two things. One, the Bible reports the destruction of the Canaanite cities and the annihilation of its people. No qualifications. Two, um, cities on the Levant coast, such as Tyre and Sidon, show continuity of occupation until the present day. See, it's Bible versus archaeology. Now, the reference for what it is worth is just simply their article that we just went through. Uh, I go on to say, no references are provided for these statements, and at least two of the statements appear to be incorrect or oversimplified. The author's first sentence describes, describing the biblical reports concerning the destruction of the Canaanites is inaccurate according to several of those reports. Although there is some variation in the biblical text as to whether the Canaanites were to be annihilated or merely driven out, and notice that there's a lot more references, although there was one that I missed, so I put it in when we're talking today. Um, but the, the, most, the majority says drive them out. And although some cities were destroyed according to the account, I'm not saying that there wasn't uh, some, you know, some of the op opponents of the Israelites got killed 100% of everybody they could get. And in fact, we're going to find some places where we know that some of them apparently got escaped. Um, what is beyond dispute is that according to the Bible, the Israelites, in fact, did not drive out all the Canaanites. That word all is important. And here's some of the references we have. And you can see two, three, and uh, we'll come to, again, three and a half, and then a whole bunch of them that, and then just for fun, there's more references that we're going to see. 12 through 14, we talked about um, uh, they didn't all get driven out. And uh, 15, 16, 17, and 18 have to do with Sidon particularly, and then 20 and 21 have to do, or 1921 and 21 have to do with uh, Rahab. The most pertinent example is the tribe of Asher, in whose t allotted territory Sidon was located. The text states that the Lord promised that the Sidonians would be driven out, but they were specifically recorded as being left after the conquest. Moreover, the basial, basis of removal seems to have been more cultural and ra than racial, as evidenced by the sparing of the Canaanite Rahab in her household when the city of Jericho was destroyed. So from a biblical perspective, it is not surprising that Canaanites, and specifically Sidonians, would leave descendants in the general area. The Bible does not report the destruction of the Canaanite cities and the annihilation of the people of Canaan in total, especially the city of Sidon contrary to the statement of the authors. The second point regarding the destruction of Canaanite cities and this destruction's being at odds with the apparent continual op occupation is an oversimplification of what is known about the histories of conquests in the region. Both Sidon and Tyre were conquered, the former by Esarhaddon, uh, a Syrian uh, king, and the latter by Alexander the Great in 332 BC. In the case of Sidon, the extent of destruction is not clear. Archaeological exploration is hampered by the difficulty of excavating a presently existing city. There's houses everywhere you want to dig. Um, and there's references for those as well. And you can look them up. And they're pretty standard. Anchor Bible, 
uh, interpreters, Bible, a dictionary of the Bible, the biblical archaeologist. I mean, anywhere you want to look, you'll find this. In the case of Tyre, the mainland city was apparently destroyed after an 11 year siege by Nebuchadnezzar. And Alexander the Great had the remains of that city dumped into the ocean to form a causeway, technically a mole, but you know, it, it was so you could walk out to the, the island to destroy the island that had escaped the previous destruction. After their destructions, both cities were reoccupied by people with Phoenician or Canaanite language and culture, but it is not strictly accurate to say the Tyre shows continuity of occupation until the present day. There was a destruction level. The authors are to be commended for approaching a difficult and interesting question in a novel way. And their genetic data give strong evidence that the descendants of the Canaanites survive in Sidon. But as human genetic approaches are applied to questions in human history, cross-disciplinary review might be appropriate in order to more accurately present religious and historical facts. It's a polite way of saying get somebody from the field to review it. Um, anyway, look at some of those texts. Deuteronomy 7.2, these are the ones that say destroy them. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. That sounds pretty destruction. But the Lord thy God shall deliver them to thee, and thou shalt destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed. Again, that sounds pretty destructive. Um, uh, the one that I'm going to kind of give you uh, that I found later, Deuteronomy 20, 17 and 18. But the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, but thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Now, interestingly, the people who wrote their reply did not pick up this text. If they had, I would be, would have a great deal of respect for them. Um, and I was, uh, and then now here's some of the ones, four and five, um, Exodus 3, 28 and 31, which is separated by a couple of other comments. And I will send the hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Kenyanite, the Hittite from before thee. I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field multiply against thee. So it looks like here, they're not gonna be killed, they're just gonna be removed from the territory. By little and by little, I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. And continuing on, and thou shalt drive them out before thee. So now, is it the Lord that's driving them out or is the Israelites that's driving it out? Well, it sounds like you can read that both ways. Exodus 33, two, and I will send an angel before thee and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, so forth. Uh, Exodus 34, 11, observe that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite. That sounds more like, you know, moving them out of the way. Exodus 34, 24, for I will cast out the nations before thee and enlarge thy borders. See, so you have this constant reference, Numbers 33, 51, and 52. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from you and destroy all their pictures and destroy their molten images and quite uh, pluck uh, down all their high places and so forth. Uh, again, the theme of driving out and and it's in Deuteronomy as well, Deuteronomy 4.38, to drive out the nations from before thee greater and mightier than thou art, as it is this day. Uh, Moreover, the Lord thy God will send the hornet among them. Again, this is Deuteronomy again, the same one that has more of the uh, uh, kill them all. Um, send the hornet among them until they are left and hide themselves from thee, be destroyed. So the Lord sends the hornet and, you know, they don't hide, they have to leave. Um, and yet, and this is 12 through 14, notes 12 through 14, yet the children of, Israel, of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. 
and Judges 1, 19 and 21, and the Lord was with Judah and he drave out the inhabitants of the mountains, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. So he couldn't do it. And they gave Hebron to Caleb. I'm going to skip over that verse because it's not relevant to this, but, and the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem until this day, which implies, by the way, that Judges was written before the time of David. Because at that point, you couldn't say until this day. And 14 and 15 is referring to specific places. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Bethshean, nor Tanak in her towns, nor Dor in her towns, nor the inhabitants of Iblium in her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo in her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. And when it came to pass, when Israel was strong, they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly drive them out. Did not drive them out. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites and dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, um, but the Canaanites uh, dwelt among them and became tributaries. And then, then this is reference 15 as well. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko, nor the inhabitants of Zidon, nor the inhabitants of Aklab or Exib or whatever. Um, but the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. So, according to the Bible, very specifically, the inhabitants of Sidon were not driven out. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemus, nor the inhabitants of Beth Anna, but dwelt among the Canaanites. And this is just more of 14, which it keeps going. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they not suffer them to come down to the valley. So the Amorites in the territory of Dan just kind of sat there and chased the children of Israel out instead, or at least the p children of Dan. And of course, they went up and made their own little city in Dan. And Hebron and Rehob and Hammon and Cana, even unto great Zidon. Um, oh, this is, this is the lot that came to the children of Asher. Verse 24 says the fifth uh, lot came out to Asher. And then verse 28 is including Zidon. Um, which is, of course, Sidon. Um, in fact, I think in the Hebrew Bible, it's the same word. Uh, all the inhabitants of the hill country, this is uh, God promising that he'll drive them out. Um, and all the Sidonians, them I will drive out from before the children of Israel, only divide it by lot. So God says, yeah, I'll take care of it. But didn't happen. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them. You've used many as Israel had not known all the wars of Canaan and then um, namely the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians. So the Sidonians are specifically mentioned as being left. And they went to prove Israel and you can read the rest of that. And Instead of driving them out, they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods. So they intermarried. Joshua 2.19, this is the story of Rahab and showing that it was not a racial thing, it was a cultural thing. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be on, upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. So if you go out the door, you're fair game. You stay in the house, we swear on our honor, we will not touch you. And that includes anybody in your house, we're not even going to check to see who it is. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are in them to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. This is Joshua instructing, okay? We're going in, we're going to take them all down. But Rahab, anybody, she and all that are with her in the house. Because she had the messengers. And finally, of course, there's a record that it actually happened. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive in her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelt unto Israel until this day. And in fact, she intermarried with the Israelites and Jesus was a descendant of Rahab. Now, here's the reply. And I'm, rather than telling you everything, I'm going to let you 
discuss what how you would reply to that or if you would. Um, Game suggests that our statement, the Bible reports the destruction of the Canaanite cities and the annihilation of its people is inaccurate and not supported by references. The Bible reports, and here's a reference, and Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, if thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened unto the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. He called the name of the place Horma. You think that answers it? By the way, if you're curious, it's Numbers 21. Interesting how they reference it, Holy Bible Authorized Version 1611. <clears throat> Within a longer count, it further reports, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who smote them and chased them under great Zidon, which is, of course, Zidon, and unto Mishraphoth and unto the valley of Mishraphoth Ether, and they smote them until they left none remaining. And all the spoil of these cities and the cattle the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves, but every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, neither left they any that breathe. Is that an adequate answer? And then they go on to say, which is fascinating, our work aimed to shed light on the relationships of Canaanites to ancient and present day populations from a genetic point of view, rather than disputing the Bible or starting a biblical discussion in the pages of a genetic journal. Think about that. Anyway, um, now text three is talking about Horma in the Negev. The king reportedly attacked the Israelites, if you read the whole chapter. The Israelites struck back, and it applies only to the south. Literally, it applies to the Negev. If you read the text, it actually has NGV in the, in the Hebrew. Text four, I think, is more germane, but it records only reaching Sidon and not conquering it. And the text calls it Great Sidon, which implies that it's still there. There's one other battle that the Israelites won against a confederation. In that one, the enemies were pursued to Makeda. We discussed that a few weeks ago. Um, but Makeda had to be specifically taken afterwards. In other words, after the battle was done, then they, they fought Makeda as well. And the parallel would imply that those Canaanites that got into Sidon escaped and that they did not take Sidon. Sidon was not mentioned as being conquered. But that's, that's my opinion. It seems obvi <coughs> obvious to me that a premise of the article is flawed. The Bible clearly records that the Canaanites, especially the Sidonians, were not exterminated. The peer-reviewed literature is too eager to prove the Bible wrong. I think the media are just too eager as well to print something that discred discredits the Bible. But I'm gonna make an even more important point. You may remember Richard Dawkins saying, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous, fiction, jealous and all proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infocidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. And I think he repeated that, if I remember correctly, in the movie Expelled. So he stands by it. Now, I don't think it's enough of a defense of the Bible to simply say that the Israelites didn't wipe the Canaanites out as God commanded. I think, uh, I would argue that the Bible records the absence of the intention to actually commit genocide. Canaanites, and in my opinion, Amalekites, that wanted to worship Israel's God were, in fact, accepted. The uh, example of Rahab comes up. Rahab was saved and everyone that was in her house no limitations were made on whether they were parents, brothers, sisters, or even blood relatives at all. You stay in the house, you're safe. You leave the house, you're, you're not safe. The deciding factor was not race, but the willingness to go along with Israelite culture. You may remember the Gibeonites were accepted. Um, when the Lord told Saul to destroy the Amalekites, he first sent a message to the Kenites to leave the Amalekites. There's no record of Saul going through the Kenites to be sure there were no Amalekites going in with them. 
If you were an Amalekite, but you were disgusted by the way your nation was being run, Paul sends a message as Kenites get out of there, you could walk out. There would be no problem. If an Amalekite wanted to reject Amalekite culture, he could do so. Didn't happen very often in ancient times. Doesn't happen very often now. People tend to go with their culture. But it can be done. Now, the Mosaic Law is very clear on the status of strangers that do not challenge the rule of the Lord. You may remember Leviticus 19.18, and it has one of the most famous passages in Scripture. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Right? Well, a little later in that same passage, specifically verses 33 and 34, And if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, ye shall not vex him. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself. The same phraseology that's used for love your neighbor. So frankly, when Jesus asked who was, uh, who was neighbor to him that uh, fell among the thieves, all good Jews knew the right answer. They might not like it, but they knew it. This is actually an improvement. Cultures, in fact, can be worthy of extermination. And I'm going to give you an example, Nazi culture. The Allies didn't kill all Germans in World War II. But they did insist that the ringleaders and those who remained loyal to them be put to death. Right? That's what war crimes were about. Many who react to is the Israelite culture side really don't think the Canaanites were that bad. That's what's really at issue here. It has now been documented that in Carthage, which was a Canaanite colony, many infants were burned to death, and the evidence strongly suggests a ceremonial cause. That is to say, they were burned in obedience to their god. Yeah. This raises interesting questions about our acceptance of abortion. Because that's basically what that was, was post-birth abortion. Culture can apparently get so bad that God can find it appropriate to drive it from the land. Now, one more point, and I think this is the, this is the fun part. It looks like we can get DNA from ancient bones. Now, there are several hypotheses regarding who the Israelites were and whether and when they conquered Canaan. Now, if one doesn't believe the stories at all, one cannot make genetic predictions, although one perhaps might say, well, it uh, didn't happen, and so uh, all of the inhabitants of Palestine should look pretty much the same, or should have pretty much the same gen DNA. If one believes they were indigenous people, which is one hypothesis, who rose up in a rebellion and then later fancified their history, one might expect Israelites to be genetically related to the Canaanites of Sidon and apparently those of Jordan. Okay? So we should find continuity of genetics all the way through, if that's the case. If one believes they conquered Canaan from the outside and Abraham uh, was actually not from Canaan to begin with, uh, then there should be a change in the genetic makeup of those buried in certain cities at a particular time, and especially that should be true of the Y chromosomes. You could see X chromosomes, uh, autosomes getting intermingled, because obviously that kind of thing happened. But the Y chromosomes should stay descendants of the children of Israel, and or what should happen is that all of a sudden people, men who die, change the Y chromosome, right? And you could identify which Y chromosome because we have plenty of Jews around now. And now we also have plenty of Canaanites around that we can, uh, we can assess that, okay? Proposals for an outside conquest, the time of an outside conquest include the 19th dynasty, conventional age about 1200 BC, early br uh, late bronze to early iron. Uh, the 18th dynasty, middle of late bronze, 1445 BC, conventional age. 12th Dynasty, conventional age 1785, although most people who believe in the 12th Dynasty think that 
that that's uh, off because the Israelite chronology is off. But it doesn't matter. The main thing is they should be associated with 12th dynasty or maybe 13th dynasty at, their, at the latest. And then the 12th or maybe the 13th and the 6th dynasties at the same time, which is another proposal. And its conventional age would be about 2180 BC or about the difference between early bronze, late early bronze and early middle bronze or maybe middle bronze one and two depending on who's doing the stratigraphy. So if you find suddenly a change, we might even be able to nail down when the change happened. Especially in the Y chromosomes. It might be very useful to establish if the Y chromosomes change and if so, when they did. We can now test biblical history. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Um, I think you are to be commended uh, for this from several perspectives. One, one, of course, is that the general scientific community needs to be more careful, and uh, you have pointed that out. Uh, but uh, you have dealt with a multidisciplinary area here that is very difficult for very few, very few people who can handle that much uh, data. And of course, they walked into it uh, with their eyes closed almost. And uh, it's uh, to me uh, shocking almost, although expected how this anti-biblical comment gained such popularity in the scientific literature and the popular press um, seems to betray an agenda behind uh, this uh, and cautions us to be extremely careful in what we do. If they can find one mistake they will maintain to take advantage of it. It's, it doesn't seem fair, but it's human nature. Comment over here. What's interesting is that uh, when Abraham moved into that area with Lot, you know, they had a huge number of men who worked as servants for him. And there's an example where there was uh, this battle, and uh, evidently some of Lot's individuals yeah. were taken captive. And Abraham and his army of servants basically went and destroyed that army that had uh, taken uh, the folks uh, from uh, uh, where uh, Lot had been living down uh, in uh, the Dead Sea area there, mm -hmm. and uh, took and then came down and paid a tribute to an individual there in Jerusalem who may have been one of the original descendants of Noah, possibly Shem. And then, so that there could have been some intermingling even between his servants and the people in that area. So the, right uh, the very first group that uh, could be the why things was when Abraham moved into that area. And then you have Lot and his uh, daughters had uh, a uh, event with him and the children that they produced became several of those different tribes that moved into the Levant and also to the east. And yep. also um, you have Esau who formed another group. So that here was an, a, a large group of individuals that are all going to be sharing the Y chromosome from Abraham's uh, progeny. Well, it, the interesting thing is that if you're going with the autosomes, there's apparently Canaanite intermarriage uh, for one thing with Judah. Um, Judah married a Canaanite woman, mm -hmm. and then he got a Canaanite woman for his kids. Uh, married two of them sequentially, he held off on the third one, and then Judah impregnated her, and so now we have uh, 
all technically Jews, actually. Uh, anybody who's from the tribe of Judah itself um, has half Canaanite blood, at least. Well, maybe not, because you know, if they married, intermarried with other uh, Israelites, then you could up the uh, percentage there. But the idea is, you know, if you're doing a 23 and Me back then, uh, you would find uh, you would find a huge admixture of Canaanite blood in in the uh, in Jewish society. So, uh, yeah, it's one reason why I don't wouldn't put too much stock in the autosomes um, because when the Jews moved back in, or when the Israelites moved back in, because you're talking about the 12 tribes, not just Judah, um, then they're going to carry all kinds of, uh, apparently also there's a mixed multitude, so there's going to be some Egyptian stuff in there. Uh, you're going to have all kinds of stuff going on. But uh, the Y chromosomes are pretty well uh, you know, traced back. So I think that's one where uh, the Y chromosome should be pretty characteristic. And by the way, this, uh, this has been done for Kohens. That is the Hebrew for priest. And so, you know, if you ever see, you know, Abraham Kohen, that's, that's a direct descendant of Aaron. And in fact, when they tested him, they find out that almost all Kohens I'm, I'm sure there's a few that kind of, um, what should I say, had other fathers that weren't, but, but that's like 99 plus percent um, of Cohen's actually share the Y chromosome that presumably started with Aaron. Uh, be interesting to see, but I think that you could probably do the same thing with uh, Levin's, L-A-V-I-N, or uh, uh, Levi, um, all of those would be Levites. And you probably find the same kind of thing with them. Um, but that, that study has not been done. But the interesting thing would be to see, you know, there are named cities that were for the priests or the Levites, and you could be able to go back and see how far back you can find priest or Levite Y chromosomes in those cities. Um, it is just being realized now that we can do that in relatively warm, humid environments. Before that, we thought that you had to be, you know, up in Siberia somewhere in order to be able to do that kind of genetic analysis. But apparently it can be done, if you know what you're doing, with, uh, with skulls anywhere in Palestine. And that makes things very interesting. Okay, so I have a question in regarding to the chromosome <coughs> divergence. If you take it back further, going back from Abraham to Noah, because at Noah you've got to go through one point. That's right. So that's right. If you're tracing from Noah to Abraham, that's not really that long of a period of time where you have a large divergence. Mm -hmm. And then from Abraham forward to now, all of a sudden you're supposed to keep a similar line for a longer period of time. How does that work? Well, you know, every time I, you produce sperm, you're going to have some of them that will have mutations here or there. In sperm, as opposed to eggs, eggs tend to have like um, extra chromosomes or missing chrom uh, missing chromosome pieces or stuff like that. They they have whole pieces missing. Or, or, or du duplicated or something. Um, but, but for sperm, it tends to be single nucleotide polymorphisms that, you know, they went and con uh, copied everything right except for flipped a, uh, um, uh, flipped a, uh, let's say, uh, an adenine to a guanine or maybe an adenine to a thymine or something like that. And, uh, and so those are the kind of things that you would be able to say, uh, how long is it probably going to take to get 
you know, five uh, n single nucleotide polymorphisms and then be able to give a rough estimate as to how much time it takes. And you'll notice that that time is like plus or minus 50%, so you, you know, you really, <laughs> we can't be that accurate with how, how long it's been. Paul, uh, you just related to that uh, question, I'll pass it on to you. Uh, what about the question of contamination here? Do they have enough samples to really be sure? Well, actually, yes, and they, uh, they're very careful with that kind of thing because obviously the person who's working on it is a human and conceivably could give you trouble. Of course, there'd be an easy way to get around that for Y chromosomes. You just let the ladies do all the handling. I was wondering, just for me personally, and probably for everybody else, when do you accept evidence that you don't understand how it came about when you don't understand it? I mean, why would I accept, what point would I accept that evidence? Is it just bought through authority? Is it just through, um, well, this guy has a degree somewhere, so it must be true, or whatever. I mean, for me personally, when I'm trying to find truth, when do I, where do I draw the line and say, well, this person says that, he's kind of, um, he's an okay guy, but still, I don't know if I had to trust him or not, <laughs> things like that. Well, that's a, that's a problem in legal society too, you know. Somebody comes up and testified, I saw so-and-so stab somebody. And well, I'm not, I'm not talking about that so much as, right. as, as people who put together things that are very yeah. complex, you know, like genetics. Right. I have hardly, I don't, don't know anything about it hardly, and yet th it seems like they're, they're, they're starting to map out people and where they came from and how this moved back and forth. It's got to be really complex, and yet they almost take it like it's, it's a fact. Well, uh, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a major problem, and in fact, in this article, as I was pointing out kind of obliquely, um, they take, what, five Canaanite people, I don't know how many people from Jordan, maybe three. Uh, it doesn't, I, when I was reading it, I couldn't really figure out how many people from Jordan. Those people were early bronze, which means that everything be, below that, or actually technically above it, depending on you know, how you're counting, everything later than that, hasn't even been sampled, at least not with this technique, at least not that they are citing. Um, so if you propose that the exodus happened any time after early bronze and the conquest, then you really haven't said all the Israelites are Canaanites. You really haven't said that. What you have said is, all the people we have tested are Canaanites, and that includes early bronze Jordanians, and early bronze, well actually to be precise, early bronze people who lived around Ein Gazal, and early bronze people who lived around Sidon. And in fact, it may be early to middle bronze, it's not clear, but in any case. Um, This gets into a complex question of, of who destroyed what in, what in what age range and stuff. And I guess the way I would approach it is this. If you have relative unanimity, and the reasons that are given sound reasonable, I take that as true until something else comes up. You know, right, and which could happen any time, and then you're going to have to assess, well, how credible is the challenge? If you have people challenging it all the time from all kinds of different directions, I tend to think it's not really settled and maybe we should not draw too many conclusions at that point. Uh, if you're having um, uh, you're having 
people who are unanimous but who all share a particular perspective, then you're going to have to determine whether they have an axe to grind or whether their opponents have an axe to grind. Um, the general principle in law is that an admission against interest is one of the strongest positives you can get. That is to say, if you get somebody on the other side saying, well, you know, this isn't my, th this, this goes against my beliefs on, on in general, but I gotta say, they have a point here. They're actually right about the data they're giving. Then that tends to give confirmation to the idea that um, maybe the, the people who are united on the one side do have a point. I mean, if we have this problem today. What did Trump do? And he says one thing and a bunch of other people say something else and you have to decide who you actually believe, right? Um, um, and, and, and sometimes you'll come up with a theory that actually allows for both of them to be right. And sometimes there are no such theories and both of them may be wrong and you don't know. And that's a huge problem. Okay, two there and then I've got you a uh, third in line. Okay. Yeah, I, I uh, appreciate this idea of using uh, this genetic analysis to in, to uh, uh, defend the benevolence of God, uh, so to speak. I, I like that because we really need to do that from these Old Testament stories because the new atheists obviously have held them have had the microphone a little too much on deciding the character of God uh, and what He's like. Um, it's much like the, the what you're describing as much like a story of the Amalekites as well. When um, uh, in Deuteronomy, uh, God tells them to remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you get out of Egypt, when, when the Lord your God gives you the rest from all the enemies around you in the land he's given you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the memory of the Amalekites under heaven. Don't forget it. So this was something that was to be part of their uh, culture and history uh, for the future. And then, of course, when we get to the time of Samuel, he has another version of this in which he says, uh, this is what the Lord Almighty says. So he's interpreting what, what was given in Deuteronomy. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid uh, the, them as they came out from Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy them. Everything that belongs uh, to them, do not spare them. Put the men, women, children, and infants, and cattle, and sheep, and can camels, and donkeys uh, all to death. Um, so he's it's that demand of this killing them is coming from Samuel, not from God. Because God said only to blot out the memory. That could be, there's many ways of doing that. But Samuel said, well, well this is how we're going to do it. We're going to just kill them all. As if, and he, in his authority as a judge for Israel, um, uh, decided that, that w it, this is how you're going to do it. It was not God's, you know, it doesn't appear to be God's will. It was uh, Samuel's uh, and the, uh, the, the desire to get revenge in the Israelite culture for what they did that drove that, not, not God's uh, intent. And uh, so there's, there's a lot of things we can do to clean up the image of God in the Old Testament. And this is a very fascinating way of thinking about uh, one way to do that. And uh, I like that. Go ahead, and then we'll pass it back. So just to respond to Gary, he's on deciding these things. And so to me, one of the issues is you have to know what people's starting premises are, too. Because you can be logical and, and using proper logic get from point A to point B. But if you're starting at, the, at a, a point that, you know, if you're starting, depending on your starting assumptions, then you can still come up with a a false uh, conclusion. So, uh, and there's no, to me, there's no rush necessarily. I mean, there'd be a few things maybe, but there's no rush to have to decide. Uh, and the biggest point on this is the great controversy. You know, it's taken, it takes a long time for the truth to come out. <clears throat> and, and you have to, 
you, you can't force it. You, you, and you're like, uh, so, so to me, things, things will come out. It'll happen in good time. And, and, uh, and you have to get things on all sides of, of the discussion before you can correctly come to a proper conclusion. So, so those are a few things that, you know, we feel a little pressure sometimes that we got to decide, um, you know, maybe, for, you know, if I have to decide do I jump or stay on the cliff, is something okay. But, but in these kinds of philosophical and, and scientific sorts of things, um, you don't necessarily have to rush. And, and the other thing, too, it's always a working hypothesis. It's so, okay, so, so for now we'll assume that this is the case, but that doesn't mean it's going to change and it's going to last, this conclusion will last forever. So, and when we have more evidence, then we can decide at that time. So that's kind of how I tend to approach these things. So, go ahead. I used to tell my students, what have you studied out? One of the reasons I would say that was because we are awash in facts today. We get the facts from CNN, we get the facts from Fox, we get the facts from somebody else. Everybody has the facts and they don't even agree. We have the facts on Donald Trump, we have the facts on Hillary Clinton. It depends on which, which group you're sitting with, who's gonna laugh? If Trump's name comes up in some groups and everybody bursts, bursts into laughter, if you bring up Hillary Clinton's name, everybody bursts into laughter. Same thing happens with science. We know what the truth is because the latest thing that we get from someplace says, we now have the facts on this, we now know. Well, tomorrow we don't know. So I would just simply say for, for me, I, I listen to the stuff coming in, I study it out the best that I can, knowing that somebody someday is going to figure out the penicillin thing. But 150 years ago or so, they didn't have it figured out yet, and it was a stupid idea. And when the thing came out about um, ulcers, and somebody says, well, they're caused by bacteria, the paradigm was, that's insane. So we hold the truth. I truths. can remember when we proved that it wasn't caused by bacteria. Yes, I remember when people drank milk all day long because they had ulcers. <laughs> um, so I, I think that when we are searching for answers, if we hold the answers we get tentatively no, and don't expect to find facts that are going to be absolute in science or math or theology or archaeology, but they're interesting ideas today. And maybe tomorrow we'll find out that they're true and maybe we'll find out that they're not. But we have to each do the best that we can. We all come from different educational backgrounds. We all come from different experiences. But, we, but we're all interested in scientific things and in theological things, or we wouldn't be here having these discussions in this class. And I appreciate the fact that we hang stuff out there and beat it up until we say, okay, we either get it or we don't, we like it or we don't, but we move on. Do we have to have the absolute truth on every scientific idea before we can talk about it? I think let's hold it tentatively in our hands and then we will, I think we can, li I personally can live with myself better if I can hold it tentatively for a while. You know, until the next paradigm shift. Or until yeah. I tell her what Yeah. <laughs> There's I'm some a, of that true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an emergency physician. And so it gets even more difficult then because you can't just say, well, you know, maybe the truth is here and maybe the truth is there. The, the, you're going to have a patient that's sitting in front of you that you have to treat one way or another or not treat, which is a choice too. And, um, and you don't have the privilege of being able to just let it go but on the other hand, you know good and well that in two years or five years or 10 years or 20 years or 100 years, what you're doing now is gonna look really stupid because 
our knowledge advances. But you're doing the best and you can. And sometimes our knowledge de-advances because that wasn't really in advance. And your example of, uh, you know, uh, when, when germs first were discovered, people thought there was a germ for everything. And then they discovered they couldn't find germs for ulcers. And then they found, discovered that if you had just the right stain, they could find germs for ulcers. And it makes a difference in how you treat them. And, uh, you know, when I started, it was the rule that if you had somebody in cardiac arrest, you dumped two ampules of bicarbonate into them, 50 milliliters. That was just what you did. And then they said, well, maybe 25. And then they said, well, don't really have to. And that one is still stuck. Uh, I can tell you when E.T., the movie, was made because they used bertillium on it. And there was a four-year period in which we used bertillium. And so you know that the movie was made during that four-year period. <laughs> and so we're, we're doing stuff and we have to make a choice knowing that it may not be the right choice. And so I'm going to say that it's even more than that. It's even when you have to decide to do something that you have to keep open the idea that you might be wrong. And you're going to have to make your best guess and go with it and be humble about whether you're doing the right thing absolutely or not. And that's true in life too. All of you people came to church on Saturday, not Sunday. Do you absolutely know that that's the way it was? Well, we have the Bible, but there are different versions and you know. Actually, no, we don't know for dad, absolute dead sure. But you take the information you have, you make the best uh, guess you can at the truth, one that's most likely to be right and beyond that is least likely to cause harm, and you do it. And there are good friends of mine who will be in church tomorrow. They are doing what, you know, hopefully most of them are being honest about it, and they're going to do, you know, and, and if they find something different, I hope they change. Matter of fact, if we find out we're wrong, I hope we change too, you know? The fact of the matter is nobody has a guarantee. You do the best you can, you move on, and you keep in mind that there are questions that could come up that could derail what you're doing. And that's a scary thing to do if you have to be right. But if all you have to be is honest, you can handle that. So I like to point out in these kind of discussions too that just, so a lot of times we think if we just give, educate people and give them the right facts, that will, then they'll make the right decision. Well, the, the thing to remember is that you can <laughs> have the facts and you can know the truth. And really, so like in, in heaven, Lucifer eventually came to a point where he was convinced he was in the wrong. So, so the truth will not compel you to accept it. So that's the other thing. It's still a choice even knowing the actual truth. And, and, and not everybody is going to choose the truth. What's fascinating in medicine is that for a number of the therapies over the years, it's almost like a pendulum swinging from one side to the other side, and eventually as more and more information comes out, finally the pendulum finally gets to the middle where you use this particular treatment for these selective cases and you avoid this treatment for these selective cases, but when it first came out, the one was Every, every person got it, and then the pendulum swung the other way. Nobody gets it, and finally comes to there. Like uh, Inderol. When Inderol first came out, uh, the start of my training program, we would give 40 milligram IV Inderol, boom, as a bolus. Now the nurses look at askance if you order one milligram IV. But back then, we didn't think at all because that was the modus operandi, and that was mm -hmm. what was thought was the correct dose, mm -hmm. 40 milligram enteral IV, right. boom, right. as a push. And then as time goes on, we get better drugs, uh, yep. somebody will use metoprolol instead of enteral. Uh, and and usually it's about one-tenth of the uh, oral dose, yep. 
and, and so yeah it, we're, no we have a moving target in terms of our knowledge and we have a moving target in terms of our ability and it just it's interesting you're a scary lot <laughs> 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 We're still practicing medicine, okay? <laughs> well, I was astounded. I was still in residence. No, at first the thing that, that terrified me was when two attendings would disagree with each other. Say, wait a minute, I thought I was <laughs> learning one thing and you guys are disagreeing? <laughs> and then the other time I had to learn, actually that's when the uh, calcium channel blockers first came out and I had to relearn atrial fib and, and you know, what were you going to do for for this and I'm still in residency and we're already learning new things so yeah and then I saw a doctor uh, who was the, who was our anatomy teacher the short guy Roberts oh, Roberts Dr. Yeah. Roberts and he's reading he's like in his 60s and he's reading an anatomy book I said what are you doing I thought you knew all this stuff and he's still reading and there's still even in anatomy there was new things coming out so you would think that that would be a static field but yeah but it isn't quite I, I was interested that uh, um, one of the guys in anatomy was sectioning people, uh, well, obviously dead people. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and you could look at the thorax, like, you know, and here's a cross section and here's where the aorta is and stuff. And everybody thought that that was kind of a weird way to learn anatomy until CAT scans came out and all of a sudden it was a perfect way to learn anatomy. So, you know, it's, it's very interesting to see what happens over time. I guess I'll ask, um, at the beginning you, back to the, the article and, and your writing back to them, you mentioned that you had gotten some things from the editors about your um, letter, just some editorial stuff, but what was their general take or response to you writing and pointing out this biblical thing that these authors had wandered into? Well, it was very interesting. It started out in a very formal relationship, you know. Uh, Dear Dr. Geem, this and this and this and this and this. Um, at the end of it, it was, um, Dear Paul, um, Regards Sarah. <laughs> that was that was when it was accepted. You know, it was it was very very interesting to see the the dynamic that was taking place, and it was. Um, uh, but but actually, they were pretty. The 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 place where it, the you could tell the tone was changing in particular. I mean, they had some respect at the beginning. At least it sounded like they had respect. But what, when it really changed was when they got reviews. And uh, they got, um, I suggested three people, they got one review from one of the people I suggested, and then they got one review from somebody I didn't suggest. And the reviews were all very, um, uh, how shall I say that, they were very very supportive of my position, let's, let's put it that way. Uh, gave a little nuance, uh, some of which I included in the letter. If you read the original and you read the one I just read to you, uh, you can tell that it's, that there's, that I've put a little more nuance into it from that. Uh, but but it, when, they, when they got two reviews that said, yeah, he's right, uh, basically, uh, at that point, uh, my stock and, uh, for them went up quite a bit, so. Do you think this would change their approach going forward when they receive additional? <laughs> my, my sense is yes, it does. And I'll tell you, one of the reasons that I think that's true is at the very beginning they said, please take out this passage because it implicates the editors. <laughs> And later on, they suggested you may want to say it this way, which again, if you look at it, could implicate the editors. So apparently at that point, they were willing to take a little more responsibility for not having picked this up themselves. Uh, 
and uh, yeah, it was it was, it was interesting. Um, but uh, I I will have to say they were most gracious about a point that uh, obviously they um, they missed along with the whoever was writing the article and whoever's writing the article still appears oblivious to the point. Uh, it's it's interesting, they didn't cha challenge the question about Tyre at all. That one they left alone. And they didn't actually, the only place that they really challenged it, if you look at it carefully, is, but the Israelites killed the Canaanites. And I don't think that was ever a point in dispute. Because if you look at it, I said some cities were destroyed. Now, what percentage, I don't know. If you read Joshua, it sounds like they killed probably, uh, they destroyed probably three quarters of the cities. If you read Judges, it sounds like they destroyed maybe a quarter to a half. Maybe it's the majority, but if so, it's not the overwhelming majority. But, but in any case, there's no question that, for example, Jericho, everybody got killed. AI, except for Rahab. Uh, and her family or whoever who was in her house. And, and in AI, everybody got killed. Uh, the Gibeonites were allowed to stay. There were a number of other cities that were allowed to stay. There were a number of other cities that were destroyed. And there's the interesting case of Jerusalem where the king was killed. The king led the southern alliance against the Israelites. But the city remained in and uh, pagan, if you want to put it that way, hands. So, um, how many of those things happen? I don't know. Um, there's one little thing that's very interesting, and it may have to do with what we're, uh, where we should put the Exodus, and that is uh, Yarmouth, uh, or Jarmouth, if you prefer. Uh, is listed as one of the five cities of the Southern Confederation. Uh, interestingly, Makeda is not. Uh, but Yarmouth was, in fact, uh, uh, although they list that well, Jerusalem wasn't fought against, uh, Yarmouth never was fought against. And yet, in late early bronze, the city just kind of disbanded. Nobody lived there anymore, including Israelites. Uh, exactly what happened is not clear. Did everybody go out and fight, including the women and kids? I doubt it. Um, did everybody realize the Israelites were just too powerful and pack up and head off towards Sidon or something? Possible. In any case, the city just came to a complete end, was never burned, just all of a sudden everything is gone. And interestingly enough, that may have something to do with the dating of the thing because if you, if you have the privilege of packing up and leaving, you may wind up taking all of your modern pottery along with you and leaving you know, the old stuff that is, is perhaps broken and chipped and stuff uh, in place. And so it may actually date later than what the, uh, what the city looks like right now. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, commentary that all of a sudden just a city just disappeared without apparently being conquered. And uh, so there are all kinds of models that you, can, that you can use to try to say what happened with Israelite conquest. Uh, yes. There's a, a couple archaeological places that suggest that the wells of an area were poisoned, and that could cause a area to be in uninhabitable if the wells became poisoned. Um, it certainly could. I'm, I'm not familiar with the precise uh, wells that would be poisoned, and the other question is, when were they poisoned? So can you use them to date a uh, conquest? It's going to be hard. But yeah, it, that's one thing you can kind of keep in mind. I'll, I'll have to find the article for you. Okay. 
Anyway, come back next week and we'll talk about The Hobbit.